They said, oh, you want to speak to the manager. So presently, a great big man came out, and he looked just like Winston Churchill. Big presence. And he said, uh, are you looking for me? And I said, yes, I, I am, sir. Well, he said, uh, what do you have in mind? I said, well, my dad said that there would be a possibility of getting a job as a board marker, and uh, I thought I'd apply. Well, what's your name? I said, well, Jimmy McDonald. And I gave him the handshake, strong, firm handshake that my mother had always told me to, you know. That's Jim McDonald, and this is the stories that brought you here a podcast dedicated to the stories of the people living in and around the Salish Sea. I'm your host, Chris Wakaluk, and it's my pleasure to get to sit down in conversation with people to hear the stories that brought them to this beautiful part of the world we live in, and also hear the stories that brought them to the point that they're at in their lives right now. Jim spent the first 16 years of his life living in various locations throughout British Columbia, and with his dad finding different kinds of employment in different locations throughout the province, Jim saw a lot of it. He'll share stories from first-hand accounts of things he witnessed, as well as share some amazing British Columbia history as well, too. By the time Jim was in his teens, he began working at the Vancouver Stock Exchange, which led to a lifelong career in the investment business. The McDonald family has a rich history on Pender, which Jim will chronicle, and also he'll give the McDonald family history that dates back centuries ago to their time immigrating to Canada. All that and more in a very wonderful interview with a very nice man who I had such a pleasure interviewing. It was really nice. And Jim is such a wonderful storyteller, which I really appreciated. What I've discovered in my life talking to people of different generations is that there's a kind of storytelling that doesn't really quite exist the same way in the younger generations. And it was a real pleasure to get to hear the shape and the pace and the content of Jim's stories that he shared. I hope that you will enjoy it as much as I enjoyed doing the interview with them. If this is your first time or or you're a returning guest to the podcast, I'd just like to let you know that there's various ways to follow along. You can listen to these podcasts now through YouTube. The page name is The Stories That Brought You Here. You can click the follow button if you're listening on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts. You can also subscribe through Podbean. And also I have a Twitter account called At Stories Brought. There are links for all of those down below in the show notes that you can find, so you can be updated as to when new episodes are coming out, which they will be coming out every two weeks for the foreseeable future. So if you enjoy this podcast and you want to be reminded easily when new ones come out, those are the ways you can do that. Thank you very much for being here to listen. So first, a little bit of music, and then my interview with Jim McDonald. Jim, welcome very much to the podcast. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. So we're finding ourselves here on a uh, Sunday morning in uh, the middle of November on a bit of a chilly day. And how has your day been so far? The day's been just fine. I uh, arrived here right on the punctuation mark, 10.30 a.m. And uh, it worked out fine. I had a little errand to run beforehand. And and uh, now we're starting with the interview. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you again for being here. And we're going to get into the first traditional question that we always get to on the podcast. And that is, of course, what brought you to Pender Island? Yes. Well, it turns out that uh, my family has uh, intermittently lived on the island since about 1894. Well, exactly 1894. And uh, I can go into great detail and I won't bore you, but Our family was part of the Highland Clearances in Scotland, and they ran down the west coast of the Isle of Lewis and evicted 171 Scots living in small villages of 50 or 60 people. And they were given the opportunity to either select Australia or Canada. And they opted for Canada. And... uh, A lot of the story has been told in the August 1st edition of the Pender Post. But what happened was there were a lot of delays, and from the time they left Glasgow until they arrived 
somewhere on the east coast of the United States because of difficulties in sailing. Some sails were actually lost in the storms, and uh, it was about two and a half to three months before they arrived in North America. Somehow they got to Brantford, Ontario, and there were 171 people from that general area on the Isle of Lewis. And at that particular point, there was uh, an epidemic, and they were held in a compound in Brantford for about a month or two. And it just happened that the government, I'm not sure whether it's termed Lower Canada or Upper Canada, but they'd been surveying different provinces or different areas to the north and west of Toronto. And uh, I think that uh, Huron County would probably be, I've only been there once, probably be about uh, 150 miles from Toronto to the northwest. And in Huron County, the largest town is called Kincardin. And they were termed at the time the Lewis Settlers. 171 of them took up land in Huron County near the town, the present town of Ripley. My wife and I went back there to see what Ripley was all about. And we got some directions as to where the church was because it was a huge part of the settlers' life at the time. And the church turned out to be away across maybe three, four hundred yards from a nearest road across a field. And we found the location of the old church. It was just rubble. And by the size of the perimeter, I'd suggest that they probably seated about 50 or 60 people. And so we noticed that there was a ravine later to find out that the ravine had a creek that ran 12 miles into Lake Huron near Kincardine. And the ravine was about 30 feet deep, and a small stream was running through it. But that's where the cemetery had been. And just before we were there, there had been a torrent, a big flood, and uh, everything was washed downstream. And I don't know what they had to do with the coffins and everything, but every last headstone was leaned up in series of eight or ten against the bank of the ravine, which to us seemed to be quite a disappointment because perhaps some of our early relatives were buried there. My great-grandfather was six years old in 1851 when they arrived there, and I don't know very much about his growing up or his family, but the next I know is that my great-grandfather was farming about 10 miles east of Winnipeg with an uncle, and he decided after a few years that he wanted to marry a woman that he knew who lived back in Bruce County on Georgian Bay. So around 1880, he went down there and married my great-grandmother. And they were the ones that built the house on Pender Island. They farmed in Bruce County for a little while, and eventually they found their way out to B.C. He went first, uh, about 1887, when the railway had been running a year or so, and he really liked what he saw in British Columbia. So he went back and made arrangements to move the family out. And at first they lived in New Westminster for a brief period and then moved to Victoria. And uh, in 1892, when they had five children, his sister married a man named Menzies. And they leased a property on Pender Island near Hope Bay which eventually became known as the Menzies Farm and then the Ross Smith Farm, which is on the valley bottom right across from the cemetery on Pender Island. After two years, Henrietta Menzies suggested to her brother that the family move from Victoria to Pender Island. Well, they said, we don't have any real means. How can we farm and do it successfully? And they said, well, we can help you. And uh, an arrangement was made with the Octorloni family to sell 
my great-grandfather, 20 acres across the road from the Benzies farm. And at the time, it was 20 contingent acres. But at a later point, the Otter Bay Road was run through the middle of it. So now that property exists of 14 acres by the old house and six acres on the other side going as far as where the RCMP are. My great-grandfather found it difficult after clearing the land to, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't suitable for farming. It was mostly shale. He cleared the property and sold the logs, boomed them up down in the head of Hope Bay, and they were taken away to sawmills. My grandfather, who was 12 years old at the time, helped in this process. He also helped my grandfather, because the house was so small, to build a, an addition, which was a kitchen at the back of the existing house. All my grandfather's brothers eventually went to sea, and by the time my grandfather was about 17 years old, and he started working for the uh, Dominion government, who were doing a survey at that time, the year 1900, of the uh, ocean bottom just off the coast at Banfield. And they worked on that for several months. It was the first permanent job that my grandfather had. And the reason they were surveying the bottom at that point was that they were about to run an underground cable to the South Seas. I forget which island it was that it was originally going to land up, but it was thousands of miles away, and they wanted to make sure everything was okay at this end before they started moving the cable in. My grandfather and his four brothers all went to sea, as I mentioned. One worked on the tugboats until he was killed at the age of 60. Another was a captain. My grandfather was a captain. And uh, fourth brother was a uh, purser on the CPR ships, all his working life. That particular brother, name was Robin, and uh, when my grandfather's and Robin's father passed away in 1917, Robin chose to stay with his grandmother a lot of the time and uh, support her financially. So Robin was working intermittently, and he was home as much as he could possibly be. And then in 1937, he, he became a husband at a fairly old age for marriage in those days. He would have been about 55 at that time. And uh, at that point, he decided that he wasn't going to leave his grandmother to fend for herself on Pender Island. And he made arrangements for one of his sisters, who was an art teacher at Kitsilina High School and lived in West Vancouver, to bring her mother over there, where Jessie lived the rest of her life. She lived to a ripe old age of 95. My grandfather lived to 96 years of age. And longevity certainly runs in the family. And at one point in the 1930s, my father, who was born in 1914, had just graduated from the first graduation class at Lord Bing High School in Vancouver. His father, my grandfather, had actually bought several lots in the heart of Point Grey when they were being subdivided. And he owned half a block in the 3700 block West 12th Avenue, which he partitioned off and sold individually and built quite a large house looking down over English Bay on one of the lots. In any event, my father graduated from high school in 1930, and you know we're going from there, because it was terrific, the effect that the Depression had immediately on the economy of Vancouver. And so for six years, my father ne never had a permanent job. He worked on the tugs. He worked on the ferry, the car ferry that went over between Steveston and uh, Crofton. And each of these jobs through the six-year period, he worked uh, in the interior for a while. But they only lasted perhaps 
four to six weeks, maybe two months if he was lucky. And so when the depression started to wane, it turned out that uh, jobs were available readily at a town called Ocean Falls, which was the second largest pulp and paper town on the west coast of North America. The largest was Powell River, but it was larger than any pulp and paper towns in the United States on the west coast. And my father and mother, my father met my mother in Point Grey. She had been born in Calgary, had lived and gone to her entire schooling in Salem, Oregon, and the family had just moved back to Vancouver in about 1935 or 36, and she met my father at that time. They were married in 1937. My father had been working at Ocean Falls for a year at that time, and I was born in May of 1938 as the oldest of four children. At the time I was born, Ocean Falls had 3,000 residents. Today it's a complete ghost town, and there are just squatters living there, 1% of that population, 30 people are camped there in the ruins of the old town, Okay, which was abandoned by the B.C. government who owned it at the time in 1978. My father always had a job from the first full-time job he had in 1936, never missed a day's work until he retired in 1978. This is the way things were in those days. Everybody that could work did so, and they felt themselves, after having lived through the Depression, to be very, very lucky to have a job. I know all my father's friends that I talked to felt exactly the same way he did, and almost to a man, they were very left-wing. They were all ardent union supporters, all of them. Just uh, to touch on what you were saying about speaking to your father's friends and that they were all left wing and all uh, staunch union supporters and Mm -hmm. also firmly believing in the idea that you better show up to work every day because you're lucky to have a job. That's quite different than how things are today, I think, uh, to some degree. Like it sounds like there is a very strong commitment uh, from those men about just working. And I guess it just goes back to what you were saying about your dad having a couple weeks of work here, maybe two months if he's lucky. So did they all feel as if uh, they were in a precarious situation if they didn't show up to work one day that they could lose their jobs? Was that actually the reality or was it just residual effect from the times during the Depression? Well, if they weren't under the coverage of a union, jobs were not as well-paying for one thing. And people that didn't work for a union didn't have all that much in the way of support, governmental support in those days. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we take to be routine and working conditions in recent years have been singularly better for the working population as a whole. The uh, union movement made many inroads and There was always support if a questionable occurrence happened in a mill or on the railways or whatever like that. The union, inevitably, they go to bat for the man. If he had done something that was criminal or so forth, why they might try to portray it in the best light, but those people certainly wouldn't have been rehired. Mm -hmm. However, if there was any possibility, the unions would go to bat for the labor movement. And so when you were having these conversations with your father and your father's friends, what age were you roughly during that time? Were you a teenager when they were speaking to you about these these issues? Yes, I was. So these conversations were these older men sort of shaping you? Definitely, because uh, I left home at the age of 17. And uh, so... These gatherings where I would be speaking to union members, you know, I was never older than 17 years of age. And uh, I think I was a little awestruck at the time that uh, my mother's brother was a good friend of the Communist Party leader. 
course, since that time, my uh, sensibilities have changed significantly, and uh, I'm uh, almost shamefacedly right winger all the way through. <laughs> and probably that came about slowly over the period of time when I was working in the investment business. Okay. Well, we're, we're going to get to your time working for the investment business, which I'm really excited to talk about. But let's let's uh, pick it up where I jumped in earlier, where it's Ocean Falls, and you're a young man there, you're a teenager. And so when you moved away at the age of 17, where did you move to? Well, to uh, review, I was born in Ocean Falls. My father, I think, had wanderlust. And my mother always went along with it, but we moved many, many times, even in little towns from one house to another. One time I counted it up, and I'd moved 14 times in 16 years wow. to a different house. So from the time I was born until we were, I was four years old, we lived in Ocean Falls. And then my father sensed there was a better opportunity in Princeton, B.C., so we moved to Princeton. That didn't work out, and he got a job in the uh, oil refinery near Sperling and Hastings in northern Burnaby. And at that time, for several months, we lived on the very top of Capitol Hill. Lovely. It was. And after that, he got a job in uh, Sawmill at Port Moody, and that was for several months. And during that period, we lived in a suite above... Uh, corner Chinese store at 19th and Dunbar. And we were going nowhere. I think my parents sensed this. And so my father immediately was taken back in at Ocean Falls. So we moved again 300 miles up the coast. And we lived there until I was seven years old. Okay. So that was another three-year term he was at Ocean Falls. Then he decided he wanted to be closer to town. And he took a job for one year, as it turned out, at the Fraser Valley Milk Producers Plant at Sardis, B.C., near Chilliwack. And I went to grade three at Sardis, the entire grade. At that point, he was offered a job that paid significantly more. I know I can remember my parents talking about how they would be able to save money if they moved up to Tassus, B.C. Where the heck is that? Very few people know about Tassus, even today. Yeah, I certainly don't. When we moved up there, Gordon Gibson, are you aware of Gordon Gibson? No, I'm not. Gordon Gibson, a book was written about Gordon Gibson after all of his jobs, his businesses, his service as a liberal member of the uh, legislature in British Columbia at Victoria. Okay. Gordon Gibson was a massive individual, both in his accomplishments and size. He was about six foot four or five, probably weighed 250 pounds. He and his three brothers made a pile of money on the fisheries on the west coast of Vancouver Island. They were all raised in the town of Ahoset, which is near... Uh, Tofino. Okay, I've never heard of that place either, but go uh, on. Yeah. Ahoset, nowadays, there was a contingent of white people lived there. Nowadays, it's an Aboriginal reservation. And no more than, I'd say, 10 miles from Tofino. And so that's where the Gibson family grew up. And they made all this money on uh, herring fisheries. And there was a fishery during the 1930s that almost eclipsed the herring. My memory isn't as great as it should be, but this particular fish, which is larger than herring, appeared on the scene around the mid-1920s, and in huge volumes, to the point where about 20 canneries were built along the west coast of Vancouver Island just to can and salt down these particular fish. And wow. as quickly as they arrived on the scene in the mid-1920s, by the time the war arrived, they were nowhere to be seen again. 
And sorry, what kind of fish was this again? I'm telling you, I can't remember the name of it. No that problem. Will, that will come to me. Okay. And if it doesn't come to you, I'll, I'll find out and I'll fill it in at the end of the show. Yeah. That's perfectly so they, fine. So they made a fortune, these four brothers. None of them well-educated. Gordon Gibson had a great eight education. And uh, my dad worked at the Hayashi Herring Saltery near the ferry terminal there, where the... Uh, Condos are built today. Oh, on Pender, yes, of course. I that do. was yeah, known yeah. as Hayashi Cove okay. because uh, the man who formed it and did all the herring salting for many years, there was a commercial building there, docks. And my dad worked there for a while during the summer of 1933. So the Gibsons decided that they were going to branch out and they started Jippo logging companies. And they logged all up and down the west coast of Vancouver Island. But by Jippo, it means that they didn't have much in the way of equipment. And they always took out the stands of timber that were near the shoreline where they were easily, easily to get at okay. and not too costly to operate the small business. So this worked into quite a fortune for the four Gibson brothers. And Gordon Gibson was the spokesperson for them. And he said, there's a phenomenal stand of timber in the Tassus River Valley. And to go back to Tassus, there were two rivers ran out at the, at the mouth, or the head, I should say, of the Tassus Canal. And it was a canal. It was like 30 or 35 miles long, half a mile wide, and absolutely straight. And at the head, about a mile apart, two rivers ran out. And one of them had nothing there, whatever. And the other had two old prospectors that had moved there in 1924 from Estonia. And they'd lived alone there all those years. When we moved to Tassus from Sardis, 1946, the town was just being built. And Gibson brothers had enough money to put in a fairly large sawmill and a town site for about 400 people. Half of that were married quarters and half were bunkhouses. So we lived there. You're talking about my history now. We lived there for uh, four years and we left in the early in 1951. And at that stage, we moved to another pulp and paper town called Port Mellon, up near Squamish. And we lived there for one year. And during that year, I was going into grade nine, and uh, there was no road between Gibson's and Port Mellon, a distance of 10 or 11 miles. Okay. So there were only about 10 or 11 of us high school students in Port Mellon. And the school board made arrangements for us to board in Gibson's through the week and to transport us between Port Mellon and Gibson's every Monday morning in a fish boat and come back Friday afternoon to Port Mellon in the same boat. And uh, during that one year that I completed grade nine, they built a brand new high school at Gibson's, which I understand is now being demolished. <laughs> <laughs> it's had a good run, I'm sure. So I lived on a farm there, boarded on a farm there for the whole school year. And the woman that had the five-acre farm was a dairy farm and chickens. And they eked out an existence by having two boarders, myself and George Hosland, who was also from Port Mellon. George and I slept in the same double bed for the entire school year. And uh, Mrs. Trithui, son, was one grade ahead of us. He also slept in the same small room. One uh, aside, a little story I'll tell you. Please. Well, she was a wonderful woman, Mrs. Trithui, and uh, her husband had extremely poor health and he couldn't hold a job. He was about 42 at the time. And uh, the year after we went back to Port Mellon and eventually we moved to the city, he died. Mm 
and Mrs. Trithui went on to live to about the age of 95 at Gibson's as a good friend of a cousin of mine. They lived next door up there. One morning, and it was the 6th of February, 1952, Mrs. Trithui came and opened our bedroom door, and she said, and we could hear martial music playing in the kitchen. She always prepared a wonderful breakfast for us, a typical English breakfast. Anyway, she opened the door, and she said, You'll not be going to school today, boys, she said. The king is dead. So that's how I remember that particular day. Okay. Well, I'm I'm actually just quickly curious. What is a typical English breakfast? Because I don't even know what that looks like. What what would she give you, boys, well, in the morning? It's, it's always a, a glass of juice, a bowl of porridge with cream on it, uh, several t- pieces of toast, and an egg and jam and uh, bacon, and a piece of toast with jam. And we weren't drinking coffee in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Not like today. There might be a glass of her unpasteurized milk on the table as well. Okay. So, uh, hearty English breakfast. That sounds super filling. That's a that's a huge breakfast. And actually, just before I forget, because you mentioned the town of Gibson's. So was Gibson's named after the family of the four brothers? Is that how that got its name or not? No. Tassus is an unusual name for an Aboriginal site in British Columbia on the West Coast. Okay. Most Aboriginal towns, like Ahusat, and uh, Cayucat, and there's about eight or nine others on the west coast of Vancouver Island, all ending in the name At. Okay. And that is the Nutka word for our home. Okay. So the Gibson brothers, by 1946, had a really going concern, and the town grew from 400 people to 800 people in the four years we were there. Mm. However, after two and a half years, one night, the mill whistle was blowing, and neighbors came over and they said, the mill's on fire. And of course, that's everybody's living up there, and the mill's on fire. So we all walked back behind the houses to a big meadow at the mouth of the river there, and across the river was the sawmill, and it was a huge conflagration, and explosions, and metal flying way up in the sky, and the mill was completely demolished. Wow. And I'm not stretching the truth, but the next morning I thought, individually, I was going to go down and sniff around and see what I could see there. And in the middle of the night, somebody with a radio telephone had called Gibson in his British property's home and said, it's gone. He said, the whole shittery is gone, his words. And Gibson, of course, I don't know if he owned a plane, but he was always flying in small beavers. He was up there early the next morning. And when I walked down to the mill, I could see him, and nobody was around him. He was standing on the road looking at the mill, and he had his head in his hands. So immediately, they decided they were going to rebuild. But all they had was the timber access for the Tassus River Valley and another river valley maybe 30 miles away. Mind you, there was a lot of timber on those two valleys. How are we going to do it? There's no insurance on the mill. So Urson Gibson, who eventually became an accountant, he was the accountant for the Gibson brothers, he heard that there would be some money available in the royal family of Denmark. What? How did he hear about this? <laughs> I don't know how he heard about it, but, you know, they were very adept. Okay. And he got, went over to Denmark, and he talked to the spokesperson for the royalty. They had lots of money. He made a hit with the royal family, and they came to an agreement right on the spot, whereas the Gibson brothers would contribute the huge areas of first-growth trees to complete large river valleys. And the people in Denmark would put up all the money for a much larger mill. And so within a year, my dad worked there installing the new mill. Within a year, it was 
completed a state-of-the-art mill, and from that point on, the Gibsons never looked back. Gordon Gibson eventually became an MLA for that part of Vancouver Island, and in the late 1950s, about eight years later, there was a big scandal. And the scandal was that certain people in the government at the time were seeing to it that their friends got these large blocks of timber. You know, there'd be a bidding process, Mm -hmm. but somehow their pals would wind up. And so Gibson got up in the legislature, 1958, and he said, this smells. He said, people are being looked after. They have no right to be. And these timber licenses are going to the wrong people. So he was told by other members of the legislature that he'd better take his information back because he was lying. And he said, no, I'm not lying. He said, I'm going to say it again. And uh, so they threw him out of the legislature. It was big, big news at the time. However, an investigation was undertaken, and a year later he was back in business again as an MLA because certain people were charged with criminal acts. He had it right. Exonerated. One other thing I might mention, and a lot of the people listening to this will be aware of this, is that a very entertaining book was written that was a bestseller in British Columbia for a time called The Bull of the Woods. And that's what he was always referred to as. This is amazing. Like so much of the things you're mentioning, I don't uh, know. And uh, I love your ability to be able to pull out all this information, dates and places. Problem is it's disjointed. (laughs) No, it's not disjointed at all, actually. But I I wanted to ask, so at at this time, you're a teenager and and you're witnessing all these situations going on and you're living in the small community with the pulp mill. What were you thinking that you wanted to do with your life at this point? Do you remember? Do you remember that... uh, the direction that you wanted to go? Well, I, I was, uh, we were one year in, in Port Mellon, and uh, my parents were dead set that their boys should all go to university. Okay. And so they decided to move to Vancouver, and they'd saved up enough money in Tassis and Port Mellon to put a good down payment on a house in Point Grey. So I went grades 9 and 10, to the same school my father had graduated that first year, 1930, Lord Bing High School. And I went for the two years, and I had decent marks. But well, what happened was, in the first two years we were living on Dun- near Dunbar Street, uh, I had a paper route the first year, and the second year, uh, everything I was doing was sort of uh, loose and easy, we might say. In other words, I was fully enjoying life as a teenager. Okay, I think we know what that means. (laughs) And that summer, when I was 15, I spent half the time, I wasn't working at all, spent half the time down at uh, Locarno Beach with all my pals. You know, in mid-afternoon, we'd get fish and chips and things like that. And, and, uh, of course, at that time, we were all starting to become aware of girls. And I just had a wonderful summer that 19... 52, I guess it was. And so I guess I was a little bit headstrong. And uh, I introduced and uh, coerced some of my friends into, as soon as we got out of grade 11 at Lord Bing, I uh, convinced them that we should all go hitchhiking. My parents weren't happy about that. Okay, so you were the ringleader of the situation. You convinced your friends. All right, okay. So there were four of us, and we decided we'd hitchhike around, and we hitchhiked up to Prince George one time, and the Okanagan another time, and uh, on long weekends, right? And so when we were out of school, we decided we were going to hitchhike who knows where. So the four of us hitchhiked to Calgary, and I had three aunts that lived in Calgary, and they all wanted to take us in, so that was no problem. We hung around there for four or five days. Meanwhile, they're telling my mother, you know, these boys are out here. They, they shouldn't be 15 years. They shouldn't be hitchhiking and whatnot. So uh, we were pretty much sent home. But the one thing I remember about that is the last night 
there was a makeshift carnival near where my aunt lived that I was staying with. And uh, they had the usual tiny Ferris wheel and rides of that sort, you know. It was pretty low-budget carnival. But they did have the crown and anchor and 21 tables and whatnot. And, of course, a big sign saying, you must be 21 to involve yourself in blackjack. And, of course, you were not 21 at this point. We were obviously all 15 <laughs> years old. <laughs> but we all lost our money. It was just as though we picked our own pockets in about 20 minutes. So I don't know how the others got back to Vancouver, but uh, Don Watkins and I, he's still a friend of mine, we were about to leave, and uh, another aunt's husband said, come on over and say goodbye to us, and he handed us a $20 bill, which today would be like $200. That's a lot of money, wow. Yeah, he says, here, boys, he, was, he had a good job, he was just about to retire. So, wow, twenty dollars. So we had no trouble getting back to Vancouver, <laughs> and uh, so that was in the week af uh, or so after uh, graduating from grade eleven. And uh, so my dad said, "You know," he said, "I don't want you lollygogging around." It was around the first of July, fourth of July in that area. He says, I, "I don't want you just wasting your time this summer." He said, "The year before, he used to have a." Uh, paper wrote, he said, and last year he said you did nothing with for yourself. And uh, I said, well, where can I look for a job? Well, he said, you know, downtown, and in these in those days it was the thing, brokerage offices generally had a ground level location. Not like today, they're in the higher floors of downtown massive buildings. But in those days, just about all the brokerage businesses had their own floor level board and the prices would come through on a ticker tape which had been around for 50 years I guess at that time and there'd be one or two or maybe three board markers up there this was their job and they'd chalking on a green board right every time a trade would or there was a change in the price or anything they'd mark it up on a board so I went into about three of these bigger places down asked to speak to the manager hiring, and uh, there was no luck whatsoever. And the reason I did that was that my dad suggested that I do that. In the 1920s, when he was in high school, he caddied at a golf course, which is no longer in Vancouver. And it was one of the three major golf courses in Vancouver at the time. It was called the Jericho Golf and Country Club. And it was on either side of 4th Avenue, west of Elma, and about three-quarters of a mile ran along, first along south of 4th Avenue and then along the beach. And he had caddied there while he was in high school, and two caddies had befriended men that they were carrying the, the clubs for. And at a later point, when they were out of high school or university, they made use of that contact, and they became bro stockbrokers. Okay. So my dad apprised me of what had happened to these fellows, you see. So that's why he suggested I go down and ask if I could get a job as a clerk or a board marker for the summer months. And I said, well, uh, okay, and I went down, and no, no dice on three of them. And uh, on the third one, I saw a fellow up there marking the board, and he'd been a couple of years ahead of me at high school. So I walked after, after I was rejected by the personnel manager, I walked up and I started talking to him. And he said, well, have you tried? And I said, well, yeah, I've been around. And not all of them. Well, he said, why don't you try over at the stock exchange itself? And it was a block away on Howe Street, 540 Howe Street. And uh, he said, you know, they've got three board markers there and a much bigger board than any of the small brokerage firms on ground level. The stock exchange was on ground level as well, but there was a board that was over 100 feet long, all down one side. And then on the other side of the exchange were phone booths. And there were about 30 or 35 brokers, members of the Vancouver Stock Exchange, and they all had a trader, and some of them had phone boys. So 
I went into the stock exchange. I asked to speak to the personnel manager. They said, oh, you want to speak to the manager? I, okay. So presently, a great big man came out, and he looked just like Winston Churchill. Big presence. And he said, uh, oh, he said, uh, are you looking for me? And I said, yes, I, I am, sir. Well, he said, uh, what do you have in mind? I said, well, my dad said that there would be a possibility of getting a job with a board, as a board marker. And uh, I thought I'd apply. Well, what's your name? I said, well, Jimmy McDonald. And I gave him the handshake, strong, firm handshake that my mother had always told me to, you know. Well, he said, I, I don't think so. No, we won't, we won't be needing anyone. This was on a Friday. And uh, so I thought, well, I went home and told my dad what I'd done. The weekend ensued, and uh, about 6.30 on the Monday morning, the phone rang. I woke my dad up and woke me up. And my dad came to the bedroom door, and he says, there's somebody on the phone for you. And uh, I went, really? So I went to the phone, and he says, Jimmy. Yeah? He says, it's Bimbo Sweeney. He went by the name of Bimbo. Okay. It's Bimbo Sweeney. Now, I've been thinking about what you had to say on Friday, and uh, this way we're going to uh, be able to allow our full-time board markers to each have two weeks' holiday. Would you come in for the next two months? And I said, would I? Well, he says, can you come down this morning? Yeah, I'll be there by, by 9 o'clock. And that's how I, my career started at the stock exchange. And so how was that experience? As, uh... it, was, it was a great experience. A great experience. I got to know all these traders pretty well. They looked after the board markers. You know, they were all reasonably well off. They were all, to a man, involved in watching sports. That's one thing I can remember. They all knew every statistic about every type of sport. Okay. And uh, and they looked after the board markers, too. If there was a game on, when they were buying their tickets for the game, most people in those days didn't have season tickets or anything like that. They'd buy a ticket for the three of us, you know, up on the board. And uh, we always got along really well with the traders and the others down on the floor. And so what was the work like? Was it really frantic? Was it a high-paced environment? High-tension high job. What you had to do was be there by 6.30 in the morning and uh, familiar yourself with what was going on. And the guys would come in over that half hour before the exchange opened at 7. And if there was something big happening, you'd hear them all talking and you knew that there was going to be activity down in the oil section or in the industrial section, you know. And so at 7 o'clock, the three of us, eventually there were four down there, would be on an elevated walkway three feet above the floor of the stock exchange. And then above that was the board, which is about seven feet high. And the bell would ring at uh, seven o'clock on the dot. And these 30 or 35 traders would all be screaming at the top of their lungs. <laughs> and they wanted to get their bids, meaning they want to buy that particular company's shares, or their offers, which meant they wanted to sell those shares, up marked on the board. And you would mark them up on the board and the number of the broker so that they'd know who to go to if they were going to buy or sell. And the, the figures were changing all the time. And you'd be working, and they gave you two hours on, one hour off. And you'd work hard for two hours. And then you'd have an hour off, and you'd go out for a coffee and a smoke or whatever. In those days, I was smoking. And there was a pool hall right at the corner there. We'd go and play pool if we had our hour to spare. And uh, we'd go and flirt with the girls on some of the other brokerage firm boards, you know, that kind of thing. And so at the end of August, they asked me if I wanted to stay on. I hadn't thought of it, you know. Okay. I hadn't thought of it up to then, and I thought, well, you're thoroughly enjoying it. Why not do that? So I went home, and I told my folks about it, and neither of them were at all happy. Well, I said, Mom, I've made up my mind. There's no way they could talk me out of it. So I finished a year on the board 
I'd only been working two months, so I worked another ten months. And near the end of that period, this fellow who was the most admired broker on the floor, trader on the floor, Jimmy McKissick was his name. He worked for a local brokerage firm called Hall Securities. And he was on the floor, and his phone boy was a man by the name of Jack. That name will come to me, too. The reason I want to bring his name up is that when he retired, he retired to Pender Island. He retired the same year that I bought the farm, 1976. And he bought a 30-acre property at the very end of Armadale Road. And he built a nice big house there. And it was waterfront. And uh, I didn't keep up friendships with him. I'd see him around on the island and so forth. You know, we were always friendly, but he was never one of my favorite guys. Okay. Jack Carlisle. Eventually, he went on to own his own brokerage firm in Vancouver. And uh, anyway, Jimmy McKissick asked me if I would ever think of working for Hall Securities. And would I? You know, just I felt as encouraged about that as I did about starting work. And at sorry, exchange. what was Hall Securities? Well, Hall Securities was a local stock brokerage firm with only eight brokers. And in those days, most brokerage firms had 20 or 25 brokers working in their boardroom. Okay. Hall Securities was different in that it didn't have a boardroom. They were on the second floor and only had eight brokers, three of whom were retired colonels from the Army. And they knew one another. I guess that's how they all started working there. Anyway, I said, I'd love to. Well, he said, I guess this was in August because I was planning to come over to my grandparents who were living on Salt Spring Island at Fulford Harbor at the time for a week. So I told him I was had a holiday plan and everything. Well, he says, I'll talk to the exchange, he said, and uh, I've already talked to the Hall brothers who owned the company. He said, and uh, if you can start on Labor Day or after Labor Day, he said, uh, we'll start you at $125 a month, he said, going up to 150 at Christmas time, and you'll get a Christmas bonus. I thought, boy, this is tremendous, because all the exchange was paying me was $90 a month. It's a huge raise. Which was typical for a boy working in, as a clerk or whatever in those days, $90 a month, 1954. So anyway, I started working there, and I worked on the floor as a phone boy for a few months, and uh, I was never a trader. But I did trade bonds, and I did trade unlisted stocks from the Hall Securities office. We had a trading desk in the office, and we would enter orders from the salespeople over the phone to Jimmy McKissick on the floor, and he'd have to execute those, those orders. Anyway, I worked for them for five years. Then I was offered a better job by a company called Pitfield Mackay Ross, which is a national firm with headquarters in Montreal. And I worked for them for seven years. And they were so stingy, not as far as salaries or commissions were concerned. They just didn't want to get into the 20th century. They wouldn't, wouldn't uh, buy the latest equipment. They wouldn't even buy, in 1967, a uh, photocopy machine, if you can believe that. Everybody had a photocopy machine, then. By that time, they did. <laughs> yeah. And I was doing a lot of business by writing my own recommendations and then sending them out to sometimes hundreds of people, you know, because I was dealing with a lot of people by that time. And they wouldn't. So I said, that's it. Either I talked to the man who was a nephew of one of the founders of the Montreal company. I said, if, if I don't get a photocopy in here within a week. I said, I'm just going elsewhere. So I had a, a good friend that was the manager of another company who had just taken over Hall Securities. So I went back to them. Okay. Right? And uh, I worked for them for uh, nine or 10 years. And so just to be clear during this time, so you became a stock trader yourself? I became a, a bond trader 
and an unlisted stock trader. Okay. But I never worked as a trader on the floor of the stock exchange. Okay. And just so for myself and for people listening to give a uh, an ex- explanation of the difference between the two, of being a bond trader okay. and being a stock trader. Mm-hmm. Well, stock traders, if they were listed stock traders, worked on the floor. And as I explained, when the market opened, they were the ones that had the open outcry method of dealing in stocks. It's known as the open outcry method. Okay. Which was only used amongst normal exchanges throughout the world until about the early 1980s. And then everything became electronic. So traders at that point, there was no stock exchange. Stock exchanges all closed down. Everything was done by computer. But up until that time, stock traders of listed securities had to work on the floor of the Vancouver Stock Exchange or the Toronto Stock Exchange. And people that dealt exclusively in bonds were called bond traders. And I did bond trading for about four years, nothing but bond trading for Pitfield Mackay Ross, who were one of the four or five largest bond traders in Canada at that time. So that was really good experience too. And also at the same time, I was doing unlisted securities trading. And I'd learned all about that in my first year or two with Hall Securities because they were doing a big unlisted business at the time. And I learned how to trade unlisted stocks. And you did that on a teletype machine. Okay. With other brokerage offices all over the place. So you got to save your voice. You you weren't uh, you weren't shouting. <laughs> no shouting. <laughs> no shouting. I, but I learned it uh, in a period when there was an enormous amount of unlisted stock trading going on, and I learned it a year the year I started Hall Securities, and for a couple of years after that, a lot of stocks. I guess because of uh, the ability to circumvent certain regulations and whatnot, they would not list on a stock exchange. There were far fewer restrictions if you sold your stocks, your shares initially as an unlisted company. And so what happened was in 1955 and 56, every major pipeline in what exists in Canada today or their ensuing companies chose to go public on an unlisted basis. And so what does that mean exactly that they're that means unlisted? That the stock exchange wasn't doing the trading, but we in the trading room at Hall Securities were trading all these unlisted securities because when they went public, the shares were distributed across North America, not only in Canada, but in the States as well. And the only place they could be traded was between stockbrokers or investment dealers. Stockbrokers generally traded stocks. The classier name as investment dealers traded bonds. You know, just to go back a little bit about your parents being upset about the fact that you didn't want to go back to school and that you were going to spend that first year uh, continuing working on with the company. As the years went on, did your parents become more appreciative of the fact that you made that decision, seeing how this turned into essentially what would wind up becoming a lifelong career? Well, uh, what happened was when I was 17, my parents decided, my father got a very good job at Crofton in the pulp mill at Crofton. Yes. So they moved from Vancouver. And at that point, I was still living at home. I said, nothing doing. You know, I'm not moving again. And so... They moved over to Shemanus, and my dad helped to build the pulp mill at Crofton. And eventually, a few years later, they moved the final job to a a sawmill at Honeymoon Bay on Lake Cowichan. So at 17, I left home, and I just continued on working in the investment business all the rest of my life. Okay. And And so... The reaction from my parents? Yeah. My father, as I say, was very left-wing, and he never really even ever, ever understood financing or why there should be a stock exchange. My mother, you know, brought me back into the fold pretty quickly. She realized that, you know, I'd found something that 
was going to stand me in good stead. She could see that, you know, but not my dad. He, he continued to be so left wing all the rest of his life. And I could never bring politics up, never, ever bring it up because he, you don't know what you're talking about type of thing. So. Yeah, that's, I guess, getting back to the the earlier part of the conversation, talking about being a staunch union supporter. So so that's what you're referring to is the fact that he was still very rooted in that way of thinking and seeing, Absolutely. His, seeing his son being involved in. Absolutely. Yeah. And so what was it for you? You can't blame him with his history, you know, the dirty 30s. And uh, I have an uncle now who married into the family. That's how he happens to be my uncle. He's 90 years of age, and he has exactly the same mindset that my father always had, even at 90 years of age. You know, I try to explain something to him about a, a financing of something that he's watching in the news. Oh, I, I can never understand that stuff. I just really don't know why there have to be stockbrokers. You know, he kind of puts me down. Mm. That would be interesting to talk about for a little bit. Why do there have to be stockbrokers? Maybe if you would take a moment to explain to myself and to uh, the listeners as well, too. I know it's probably a very long answer, but if you're able to provide that answer right now, that'd be interesting. Well, you know, there have been different methods of financing over the centuries, right? And the early explorers in the 1400s, 1500s, went to the Queen of Spain or King of England, they, they wanted financing. And quite often, the royalty would provide that financing. But on certain occasions, it wouldn't be provided. And certain firms were created to arrange financing for very ambitious goals. You know, the Hudson Bay Company is the oldest financing of that nature in North America, I believe. So about that time, a lot of new companies, well, not a lot in current terms because there are many, many thousands of listings because of the wonderful ability to arrange financing for just about any company these days. But the Dutch were the first, and they had a lot of initiatives, new companies they wanted to form particularly new banking companies, and they had to have support financially for these banking companies, insurance companies. These were all first financed in Holland. And other countries saw that there was a great potential. You know, we can increase our GDP. There was no GDP in those days, but they were encouraged by the royalty or by the parliament or whatever it was to finance on that basis. And so different methods of financing were arranged, but the common shares uh, became de rigueur within 100 or 200 years of the initial financing right-wing basis, right? So, well, by the 1800s in the United States, you know, they went through different phases, and the biggest one was the railroads. How is one man or one family or one group going to finance a railway from St. Louis to San Francisco. Not going to happen. But it happened through the wonderful ability to finance through common shares. And so nowadays, the New York Stock Exchange, I believe, has about 6,000 listings. And uh, there are other exchanges. I think there's about 3,000 listings on the Toronto Stock Exchange, most of which are what are termed penny dreadfuls. Very low-priced promotional issues with a piece of moose pasture somewhere that they're promoting on the basis that it has a, the great propensity to find enormous wealth on this particular block of land. You know, and I'd say of the three thousand listings, perhaps eighteen hundred of them fall into that category. Okay. Wow. Yeah. The one thing I did want to make sure that I asked as well, too, is that what was it about the work that you really enjoyed uh, that made you stay on working in it? What was it that really uh, spoke to you that said, yeah, I want to continue this as a career for the rest of my life? Well, you know, I was quite young at the time, 
just turned 16 years of age and was impressionable. And immediately when I saw the type of individual, A-type personalities that worked in the brokerage business, very bright to a man, upbeat, masculine. I, I thought all of these features were what I would like my life to be. It uh, didn't take me long to realize that uh, there was a big potential financially to pursue a career in the stock brokerage business. And uh, whereas I was never one of the best performing brokers in the world, well, I was on one particular year, <laughs> but the rest of the time I was a run-of-the-mill broker, thoroughly enjoying my career and uh, never regretting it. Never regretting it. I don't regret it to this day. It was, it was uh, provided a very good living. And uh, I don't know if I'd have been able to embrace that particular line of work, uh, even if I'd had a university education. And the reason I say that is that I knew the management at the different firms that I worked for. And uh, for example, the last year I was working, 1997, a couple of brokers, had one had died and the other one had retired and they had 35 brokers in the office. And it was a, an international brokerage firm, Merrill Lynch, Canada. Merrill Lynch being the largest broker in the world. And this was their Canadian subsidiary. And they had a spot for two brokers. And they advertised, I don't know where, but they had over 100 applicants all qualified to take that job. Well, not all qualified, most of whom were qualified. Okay. And one of the qualifications was a business major, business major. And the only people they talked to were MBAs. You know, it was narrowed it down to about four or five, of which they hired two. How could someone with a grade 11 education today ever consider the possibility of going into that career. Yeah, impossible. It was it was just my timing was impeccable. <laughs> <laughs> timing is everything. Uh it really is actually. It really is. But also I, I think that staying committed has a lot to do with it as well too, because you stuck with it. Right? Like your timing was great, but the thing is had you not pursued it and continued and it it mm -hmm. would have never happened, right? But mm -hmm. Uh, I, I want to bring this uh, into the uh, the Pender Island phase of things as well, too. When did you start your own personal connection with uh, living on Pender Island? Or do you start the connection with with uh, owning a property on Pender Island? And when did you uh, move here full time? Well, that's, that's interesting. When I was 14 years old, my grandfather, who was in his 70s by that time, had taken on a summer job as the captain on the Sai Peck Ferry. It was called the Sai Peck. And it ran between Fulford Harbor and Schwartz Bay. And he relieved the full-time captains for the two summer months. And during that period, they lived on a cottage on some friend's place at Fulford Harbor, the Hepburn family. So toward the end of uh, the year I was 14, my grandmother said, come on over with your brother Terry, who was three years younger than me, for a week or two toward the end of the summer. And, uh, you know, there's children over here and you can play and find your way around the island. It'll be different for you. So we took the ferry. It was a foot passenger ferry from Steveston to Fulford Harbor. And uh, it was only about 100 feet long. <laughs> Pointy bow. Anyway, the Saipek was a car ferry. I don't took, I don't think it took more than, no more than 60 cars compared to our new Heron ferry, which takes 160. Yeah. So 60 versus 160. And my grandfather ran back and forth on that little jitney run. You know, and so we had a good time, Terry and I there. And after about a week, my grandmother said, 
I've been in touch with your Uncle Robin over in Pender Island. Would you boys like to go over and spend a week with him? And, well, sure. So we got on a, another inter-island ferry. They were much smaller in those days. And we got off at Port Washington. And my great uncle Robin, who had, as I say, been supporting his mother all those years up until 1939, uh, he'd been, his wife, he'd just gotten married two years prior, his wife never really cared for the farm. And the reason was that she had to live on it. It was their only home for the first nine years of her life, which were the five war years and the following four years. And during that period, the old house there had never been wired. Well, there was no electricity on Pender Island. Okay. That's, that's one reason. <laughs> but it had never been plumbed either. Oh, no. And so there's just an outhouse, you know, 40 feet behind it. And she had to live the war years when Robin was away as a purser, a lot of the time on her own. So she kind of detested the old place. Anyway, Robin grew up on it, and he loved it. And so after 1949, when they essentially moved to the city, he'd spend two or three summer months every single year down here on Pender Island. And so in 1952, he uh, was there and he asked my grandmother to send us over. He picked us up at the Port Washington Ferry, but I must tell you, he didn't really pick us up. He didn't have a car over here. So with our pack sacks, I guess, we probably didn't have suitcases, but we each had a pack, and he walked us the three miles to the farm. <laughs> on a gravel road, and uh, I, I don't think we were too happy about it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, no, there's two bedrooms upstairs you boys can use. So when we got upstairs, my brother looked at me. He was 11 years old. He said, did you realize there's only 13 stairs? You know what that means? <laughs> you know, the bad luck with 13, the number 13. So already he was he was like he was looking for problems. Your brother was like it, it wasn't resonating yeah, with him. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So every day my uncle would take us on a walk, and they were not short walks. He knew everybody on the island, of course. We'd, we'd get to the ob objective end of the walk, and he'd talk for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we were cooling our heels, you know. So we didn't really enjoy it all that much, but to me, uh, I loved to see the old house that had been in the family even then for so many years. And uh, one other thing is that he wasn't the greatest cook. And every night we sat down to dinner, well, first of all, at lunchtime, all he ever fed us were cucumber sandwiches. That's Same thing every meal. You know. And at dinner time, we always had meat, which he claimed was lamb. But my brother said, no, he said it tastes more like venison. <laughs> It, it probably was venison. It's it's. Oh, I'm sure it was venison. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, at what point in your life did you? Just... So the next year we went down there again. Just well, I guess we thought that it was an interesting sojourn, so we did the same thing again for a week. We didn't go to my grandmother's this time. We just went straight down to see Uncle Robin. Anyway, uh, in 1949, I don't know. What I was going to say is that he kept on going down there for many years after 1953. And in 1969, he was down there alone, and he was picking apples. And he fell out of the apple tree. He'd have been 72, and he broke his hip, and six weeks later he was gone. So my great aunt, by marriage, inherited the property. As I told you, she wasn't too happy about it. There were hippies in, the, in that era, 1967 to 1976. There were hippies, lived in pretty good numbers here on the island. And uh, they started to break windows and things like that. And she was nowhere around, and people would tell her about it. So finally, she had a fellow that did odd jobs for her, Einer of Einer's Hill. Yes. Fame. Heiner had a little shack right at the top of the hill there. 
And so she had him buy cheap plywood and nail up on both floors every window. And the problem was over the years that didn't stop. He kept having to go back and nail nail the plywood up again. And at one point, George Ross Smith said he saw some somebody leaving the place with this beautiful old Finley chrome stove that had been there for, since day one. The ha- hippies had stolen it out of the house. Why he didn't do something about it, I don't know. But after seven years, Vera decided she was thinking of selling it. And uh, she gave an option on the property to a fellow that lived down at Bricky Bay. The man's name was uh, Alfie Evans. He lived just on the beach above Bricky Bay. And Alfie Evans was the biggest prawn broker in Vancouver City. Down in the Lower East Side, he had a prawn brokerage firm bigger than any, right at the corner of Abbott and Hastings. And uh, he was very wealthy. And he had in mind using the McDonald property, bear in mind it was two properties, two pieces there, for uh, having a community center and a shopping center. And then he changed his mind. I don't know why. And so Vera was back aloof and trying to sell the property again. And uh, I was talking to her one time. She said, would you be interested in it, Jimmy? You know, it really hadn't occurred to me, but then I thought, well, no, that would be kind of neat. And uh, so she said, well, I'll make it easy for you to buy it, which is what she did. And uh, I, I didn't hesitate. I, I bought it. Uh, and from that time on, we spent most holidays, weekends, three-day weekends down there, and many, many summers down there, as it was uh, our holiday home. And uh, so I owned it for... 16 years. And uh, in uh, 1992, I decided that uh, I'd done just about all I could do around there. And there was a talk in 92 of having a community center there, making that the community center. And so they asked me if I would sell it. And they would put it on a referendum. And I said, I was ready to sell it, you know. So I said, yes, I'd sell it. And they said, well, what's your price? And I told them, give you a good deal on it. I gave them a discounted price over what the realtors told me it was worth. And uh, so they held the plebiscite when all the community plebiscites were held in October. And that same 1992 October, there was a second issue on the plebiscite. And that was, should we build a second fire hall at Magic Lake? And so the plebiscite... uh, passed on the fire hall, just barely, and it was turned down just barely on purchasing the McDonald farm. Mm. A matter of 10 or 15 votes on both cases. Okay. People had priorities, of course, and probably it was for the better in the long run. So uh, I immediately put it on the market at the higher price, and the first person that came along purchased it. So I put that money aside and thought if I ever had the opportunity to buy just the right piece of waterfront, I'm going to do that. And so that came along about two or three years later. And uh, Linda, the uh, very successful realtor here on the island who had sold the farm, she, uh, I saw the advertisement in the paper and that was in 94 that particular property was up for sale. And I thought about it for a week or so, and I thought, no, let's act on it. So I phoned Linda, who had the listing. She said, I'm sorry, Jim, it's gone. Somebody's picked it up, an architect, she said. And I, whew. I was a little mentally upset by the fact that I'd missed it, you know. And a year later, the same property came on the market, and it was listed in the uh, Pender Post. And they were asking more than the year before by a fairly fairly large amount. So I thought about it for a few days. And I thought, no, I don't want to miss it. So I phoned Linda up. She had the listing again. I said, what's going on with that property? It's only been held for a year. Well, she said, the uh, man who purchased it a year ago was an architect. And he actually designed a few houses here on Pender while he did live here. 
but he was from South Africa. And when he was in South Africa, he worked for an international firm of architects with their head office in London, England. And she said after a year here, the head office contacted him and told him if he comes back to the head office, they'll make him a partner. It was a no-brainer for him. Mm -hmm. So he put it up for sale. And after some lengthy negotiations, I bought it. And uh, two or three years went by. And then I decided, you know, I'm, I'm tired of all this malarkey with computers. The firm I was working for then, Merrill Lynch, they were springing a different type of computer uh, regimen on us. Seems like every few months. And I was getting tired of learning all this new business to do with computers. And I wasn't that literate with them in any event. I thought, no, this is a perfect opportunity to retire. So I retired in February and the 4th of July that year, 1998, we started building. Okay. And how long did it take to build that home? Well, a very fine builder on the island here, I can't say enough for him, Steve Wright, was given the contract to build the home. He took all kinds of measures, since it was a waterfront place with a southwest, southeast prevailing wind, uh, to make the place completely draft proof. And one of the things he did, amongst many others, was on the two sides, the south and the east side of the house, he not only put thicker plywood, you know, instead of what the building code said, you could use five-eighths inch plywood, he put three-quarter or seven-eighths inch plywood on. He then did the wrap that you see on all new houses, you know. And then in addition to that, he put 40-pound roofing felt on that side of the house. In addition to that, he had the carpenters, who were a very worthwhile bunch, glue every window into place. The shing it's a shingle-sided house. So the shingles were, were glued to the moldings of the windows all over the house, up and down. Things like that. You know, he did a phenomenal job for us, and he did it in six months. Wow. I actually interviewed Steve Wright for the podcast uh, a few years ago, and he's a great guy. And it's it's nice to hear uh, somebody speaking well of the work that he did as a contractor. That's fantastic. Yeah. I um, think he's pretty much retired now, though. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah. So so then you, uh, you've you retired to Pender Island, and you've been here for over 20 years. And I feel like we, we went full circle there from the beginning of the show about what brought you to Pender Island. And you just laid out a tremendous amount of history in the very beginning. And we're just going to wrap it up in a little bit here. But the question I actually wanted to ask for a long time during this hour and a half that we've been talking is that your detailed memory about your family history and lineage going back to the 16th century, if I remember correctly, where did you hear all this information about your family history and why was it important for you to memorize it the way that you have? Are uh, you speaking of family history in the last 70 years or the earlier history? The last 70 years, the the early history, all of it. It seems that you have a, a very detailed memory about many things. I'm just wondering about when, because when you were talking about your family first coming over to Canada, but then being overseas as well. And mm -hmm. I was thinking when you were describing all this, this is amazing that you actually know all this information. Where did you get well, all that? Uh, the son of Victor Menzies, the Menzies farm, uh, was the same age as my grandfather, and about 1970, he decided to do a history of the Menzies family up till 1970, and he did a thorough job of it. I have a copy of the little booklet that he made, and uh, even though I didn't ever know many of the Menzies all that well, I took an interest in reading it and seeing how the family came together with the McDonald's and so forth. And then he asked my grandfather, a couple of years after that, would you like me to do the same thing with the MacDonald family history? So that's where I encountered it for the first time, really. I had little squibs along the way prior to that, but it was all um, put into chapter and verse in the booklet that he turned out around 1978. And any history I learned from there was basically, you know, Apart from the one trip we took to uh, 
Huron County. And uh, I want to mention, while it's on my mind, and even though it's nothing to do with the question you just asked me, when my wife and I went back to Huron County, and we went to the village of Ripley, which has about 600 people there, it's a farming area, there were two cenotaphs right in the heart of the town, little town. They're both about 10 feet high. And one of them is listing the men that went to fight in the First World War. And there were 200 men. And it just listed them all. 50 of them were McDonald's. Wow. Then, 40 or 50 yards down the main street, there's another cenotaph, not quite as tall. And there's a name of 25 men that are, I checked back, on the first cenotaph. And they're the ones that were killed. So 25, almost exactly 12.5% of the men that fought overseas died. That's a huge percentage. It really is. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming and sharing all the things that you shared. I, like, I, I feel as if we're, we're just scratching the surface of your family history and your personal history, but I loved all the things that you had to share today. And I just want to know, is that there anything that you want to end off by saying that, uh, you didn't get an opportunity to tell today? Is there anything that you want to mention to the people listening that, uh, you feel like you, you want to say? Well, opportunity is a very good word. I, I view it that way as well. Why does the word opportunity uh, stand out to you? Because when I first heard that you were, you'd taken on this, well, you don't view it as a chore, but there's a lot of work involved and a lot of interest involved. And uh, I'm pleased that, number one, the Octorloni family chose to investigate and uh, do a review in the August issue of the Fender Post. And I'm even more pleased that they have uh, vowed that they're going to make a uh, page on the folders that they have about the early families that is in the museum on our island. And they're working on that right now. For some reason, the McDonald family was overlooked when the, when the original, uh, pages, about two feet by two and a half feet in size, one for each family. When it was uh, constructed, a lot of the early investigation was done, according to Sandy Octorloni, by school children. And somehow they missed our family. Oh, no. <laughs> but they're going to they're gonna reconcile that. They're yes. going to fix that. All right. So I think that both are opportunities. Both your interview and the fact that Sandy has taken an interest in our family. Right on. Well, that's great. And I, I can't say enough again how great I think that the stories that you shared today are, and I really appreciate you coming to share those with me today. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for sticking around to the end, and thank you again to Jim for doing that. That was great. Incidentally, the name of the fish that we were talking about in the podcast, Jim emailed me later on that evening after we finished recording, and he informed me that it's called a pilchard. I believe I'm getting that pronunciation right, I hope. But it's a type of sardine, that fish, which incidentally got me craving sardines, and that's partly what I had for lunch today, just in case you needed to know. I'd like to say thank you to Ben McConkey for providing the theme music to this podcast, and apparently I hear on a lot of podcasts that if you leave reviews... It helps for the podcast to get put up and promoted on different sites like Apple Podcasts and Spotify so other people can have a chance to stumble across and find this podcast, which would be great. So if you feel like leaving a review, please do. And also, please have yourself a lovely day. And until next time.